it had been uh, a messy affair. A top 10 messy affair in the history of messy affairs. But now at last, thing, things seem to be going well. I mean, after all, who could fault a king for indulging his, his fantasies? That's what kings do. I mean, you know, one night you, you go out for a stroll on your deck and you, you see a beautiful woman. I mean, you're the king. You kind of want what you want when you want it, right? So you take a stroll on your deck and you see a beautiful woman and, and you want her. You send for her. She comes to you. It's as simple as that. Kings have been doing that sort of thing since the beginning of time. Whatever the king wants, the king gets. That's why they call him the king. And in that day, in that time, it, it, it shouldn't have seemed like a big deal. It still happens today. Who among us is, you know, are we ever really surprised to find out that a politician has, has someone on the side? The king uh, felt like things had, had finally settled down. There, there was that problem, though, with the woman's husband. Not an easy thing to get, to get rid of him. He, he was the loyal soldier type who would not easily be deceived. I mean, he just wouldn't go with the plan, the king's plan. So the king had him killed. Complicated in, in a way, but hey, the man, he ended his life as a hero in battle. Doesn't get much better than that. Then the king felt free to take the woman as his wife, so he did. And then came the happy news that the woman was pregnant. And all was right in the world. But, right when we think we've gotten away with something, there's, there's always a well-placed conjunction to trip us up. But... Proverbs 28 and verse 13, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But, Numbers 32, 23, and be sure your sin will find you out. And, and indeed, his sin did find him out. 2 Samuel 11, verse 27, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Enter the, the prophet Nathan, you remember the prophet Nathan? He was, he was kind of David's pastor. So God sends his man, Nathan, to request an audience with David. And, and, and Nathan begins to tell him the story about a, a rich man. And this rich man had everything. He had houses and he had servants and he had land and he had tons of sheep. Tons of lambs there was a poor man and the poor man had almost nothing but he had one little baby sheep one little lamb and the rich man's like I want that go get it take it from him I want it he took it he killed it he ate it and David just like us we're getting worked up as we hear the story David says, bring that man to me. Let's kill him. And Nathan utters these famous words. He speaks truth to power. How courageous. He says, oh, by the way, King David, you are that man. In a moment, in one heart-stopping instant, the king knew the truth. He knew what Nathan was saying. He knew that he was the rich man who had cheated the poor man. The king knew. And very quickly, the word of the Lord comes to David. And God says these words, David, I gave you everything. David, I made you king. And if that were not enough, this is amazing. How do you get more than being a king? I would have given you more. God says, why did you despise my word? Like, you didn't believe it? You didn't trust it? You got a better word? 
you took this man's wife, you had him murder, murdered. Because of this, there will be nothing but trouble for you from this day forward. Your family will suffer because of your sin. Then came time for the king to do the hardest thing that anyone could ever do. He had to look in the mirror and he had to utter these three words. The toughest words in the English dictionary. I have sinned. I've sinned. No one wants us to say those words. I have sinned. We would rather do anything than, than say that. But there is no getting right until we admit how badly we've done wrong. Let me say that again. There is no getting right between you and God until we admit how badly we've gone wrong. Let me welcome you back, especially if it's your first time. Let me welcome you to our series in the Old Testament book of Psalms, God's songbook. Do me a favor, turn with me if you, if you haven't already in your Bibles and your Bible apps to Psalm 51. You can also go to the Version Bible app and my outline is there so you can, you can take notes. Okay, back to David. So now, through his tears and his, his deep guilt, K King David, he sits down and he writes a song. He writes a poem. He writes a prayer which is called Psalm 51. And 3,000 years later, we come back to it again and again and again because it tells us what it means to come back to God when we have sinned. It is a psalm of lament and penitence. You say, well, what's that? Lament means it's a psalm of sorrow. Penitence means it's a psalm of repentance. In case you wanted to know, there are 67 psalms of lament, either in whole or in part. There are seven psalms of penitence. Psalm 51 is both. Martin Luther, the reformer, once said these words. He said, all of a Christian's life is repentance. And I think what Luther is saying is that repentance is not something we do to start the Christian life, but repentance is a posture towards God that we, we adopt that conversion and then we maintain the rest of our lives. The, the deeper problems in our, our Christian life start when we stop repenting. Let me say that again. The deeper problems in our Christian life stop, start, pardon me, when we stop repenting. I, I just keep thinking about this with King David. I can't get this out of my mind. Like King David, David first, before he was king, was God's anointed, God's chosen, the sweet psalmist of Israel, a man after God's own heart. He walked with God. He wrote love songs to God. He did battle for God. He trusted God. I mean, this, this is David. And I keep thinking, how did he get to a place where lust, adultery, deception, and murder were all right? I mean, literally, he went, he got to a place where he went, I'm okay with this. And it hit me. He got to that place because somewhere along the way, he stopped repenting. Maybe he had a, a fight with his wife and he said, you know, I probably should get that right. Nah, I'll just, I'll, I'll tuck that one away. You know, maybe, maybe before Bathsheba, he, he looked at some, some young ladies he shouldn't have looked at. And he began to think some thoughts he shouldn't have thought. I need to get this right, man. And I'll just put that one in the closet. I don't know. I know this. Somewhere along the way, David made a series of choices to stop repenting. To stop preaching the gospel to himself daily. That's why Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray every day, forgive us our debts. Isn't that a great prayer? They're like, Lord, what should we pray? Here's what you need to pray every single day. Forgive us our debts, Lord, as we forgive our debtors. Daily we remind ourselves and we confess to God that sin saturates our hearts through and through. The discipline of repentance is, is vital. So this morning, I want us to think about the role that repentance should play in our lives. And, and, and I want us to recognize that it's imperative for us to repent on a daily basis if we're going to fully experience the pleasures of God 
and ultimately be conformed into the image of Jesus. So, you're probably thinking, well, man, help me out here. Give, give me a definition. I got a definition for you. It's a little bit long, longer than usual, but I, I like it. I like it a lot. Repentance means literally a change of mind. You, you know that. And that change, this is where it gets a little bit longer, involves three things. Our intellect, our heart, and, and our will. So it involves our intellect, changing our opinion about something, acknowledging that God's truth is right. You say, well, well Lee, what does that look like? Here's what it looks like. You've got the truth of God's word in, in one hand. And then you have um, the, the culture in your other hand. And you look at culture and you look at the truth of God's word and you make an intellectual choice to go, I will believe in God's word. You say, well, Wow. I didn't think of it that way. That's, that can be really, di- yeah, it can be really difficult. We walk by, by faith and not by sight. We, your words are true, every one of them. Let God be true and every man a liar. And so we make a choice to go, whoo, culture, it's right there. But I, I'm going to intellectually believe in your truth. So second aspect of repentance is, is the heart. Changing our feelings uh, about that sin feeling pain and sorrow over that sin. We make an emotional decision because we repent so often. We preach the gospel to ourselves every single day, and when we do that every single day, we become very sensitive to the things of God. And so when I repent every single day of those things that desensitize me and I put them out of my life, I become really sensitive to the things of God. And so when I sin, then I go, oh, why did I say that to Ruth? That was inappropriate. That was wrong. That hurt her. It hurt you. It hurt the spirit of God that lives inside. I shouldn't have said that. But if I don't repent in that moment over time, pretty soon, I'm saying things to Ruth I shouldn't say, and pretty soon, I don't care. I don't care. Thirdly, repentance is the will. This is the most common one we think of. It is changing our behavior. So I acknowledge intellectually that God's word is true. Every man is a liar. Emotionally, I repent so much that it becomes part of who I am, and I'm sensitive to the things of God. And then here's what happens. When the confrontation, when I'm confronted with the sin, I'm looking right at it, and I go, oh, I'm going to do a 180. Now, first service, I said a 360. That's not cool, right? <laughs> and I think some dude's thinking, about time. I love turning back into my sin. Well, I know. We all do. That's the problem. So I, I go... Uh, oh, oh, she's beautiful. Oh, I want to gossip. Oh, I, I shouldn't be angry. I'm not going to do this. Lord, help me. And I go this direction. That's repentance. That's repentance. That's Psalm 51. Psalm 51 has been the lifeline back to God for, for generations of believers, first among the Jews who, who learned it, recited it, sang it. How beautiful. Then among us, believers, New Testament believers, who we have adopted it as our own. The words are so universal that they belong to anyone whose heart is broken because of, of sin. So, here's great news. This is a little heavy right now, I know. We're going to go in and out of heavy and joy. Heavy and joy. We'll finish strong on joy, Okay? Just want to tell you. Here's joy. If you've blown it, here's a word from God for you. If you look at the wreckage of your own life, knowing that you have made bad choices, if you despair of ever finding forgiveness, here's what we're going to do. We're going to journey together in Psalm 51 because it has a word for you today. The devil, and sometimes your flesh, says, you've got no hope, baby. You're worse than David. The word of God says, hey, I... Let's acknowledge that you're a sinner, but now there's hope. (laughs) Come to me. Okay, Um, I want to give you a macro view of where the talk is going to go today. Three three things, you ready? David is going to confess. There's going to be confession. There's going to be healing. And there's going to be devotion. David was basically praying three words. I want want you to see these three words. And you can say it as a mantra to yourself and then live it out. He says, God, forgive Forgive me, cleanse me, use me. Forgive me, cleanse me, use me. So often here's what we do. We go, whoo, I don't want to go through the forgiveness process because there's lament and repentance there and there's acknowledgement of who I really am. Just, will you just cleanse me? No, 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 no. I got to forgive you before I cleanse you. And here's what's really cool. When I forgive and cleanse you, then I use you. Well, can't you just use? No, I can't use you unless I forgive and cleanse you. 
All right, let's start with confession. Psalm 51, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, King David writes these words, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Yes, according to your great compassion. All right, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. We're getting somewhere now. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Do me a favor. Look at verse 1 again and, and look at the first six words. Underline these. He says, have mercy on me, O God. Now, what is the basis of David's plea? What, where is his hope? The mercy of God. Notice where it's not. It's not in any of his past deeds, his past accomplishments. He doesn't look to his life resume, right? It reminds us of Philippians where Paul is like, everything I did in the past is like dung, is like you know what. That's what David says. He doesn't say, hey God, by the way, um, on, on, a, on the whole, I've been a pretty good person. Remember that whole deal with Goliath? That was me. Hey, hey. and I wrote those cool songs, worship songs, I did that. Oh, that ark thing. Like I went down, captured it, came back, did the cool dance. Uh, yep, me too, again. He doesn't do that. David doesn't try to rationalize. He doesn't, he doesn't try to say that his sin isn't too bad. He doesn't say, God, do you have any idea how hard it is to be a king? There's a lot of pressure involved here. He doesn't do that. Also, this is, this is interesting. David doesn't try to bargain with God by making a bunch of promises about the future. You ever do that? It's like you're asking for God's forgiveness on credit. God, I need you to let me off on this one, and in return, I'll make it up for you in the future. I'll be the best husband and follow, follower of yours forever if you just give me a pass on this one. David doesn't do any of that. He puts all of his hope in one place, the mercy of God. There's no yeah, but. Yeah, but yeah. No. Oh, God, your mercy. Have mercy on me. It's kind of crazy. I have one plea, I have one hope, your mercy plus nothing. Now here's some great news. For those who make the mercy of God the, the sole basis of, of your plea, you will never be turned away. You will find there's literally no limit, no end to the mercy of God. Every person who came to Jesus in the New Testament um, and pleaded for mercy were not turned away. But, but, the ones who are turned away are those who still hold on to some reason God should be or is obligated to be merciful to them. Being delivered from our sin is easy. It's being delivered from our religion that is difficult. You say, well, what, that's deep. What does that mean? Okay, let me put it this way. Our sin separates us from God, but our self-righteousness keeps us from him. I bring something to the table. You know who I am? I'm an Epstein. And your point is what? I, I, I do stuff. I don't need your stuff. I, I need a broken and contrite heart. That's what I need. Verse 4, David says an extraordinary thing. He says, against you, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Under, underline that too because it kind of throws you off a little bit. He says against you and you only have I sinned. That doesn't feel right, does it? Because didn't he sin against um, Bathsheba? And then Uriah, not, not, not once but, but twice, right? And then didn't he sin against the people of Israel? He he didn't fulfill his do Yeah, yeah. You say, well, well Lee, what's, what's, what's going on here? The reality is, when David dies, he'll not give an account to Bathsheba or Uriah or the people of Israel. Bathsheba and Uriah and the people of Israel cannot save David from his sin. Culture can't save David from his sin. Only the one who judges righteously. Ultimately, all sin is treason against Almighty God. And until we grasp that, seal it, uh, 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 see it, feel it, and confess it, we cannot be forgiven. Verse 5, 
David is really going now. He's really understanding this. He says, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. David says basically, sin, oh yeah, it comes natural to me. I was born like this. I don't even have to practice. I'm just good at it. And you know that? How many people in here have, have, have had children? Okay, you, don't be ashamed. Raise your hand. There we go. <laughs> you know this. Oh, my little baby's so precious. Okay, behind the scenes, what happens? No. How do you even know to do that? You were conceived in sin. <laughs> he says, I'm just good at it. I'm owning this. My behavior was not even an exception. That's just how I am from birth. In his prayer of repentance, we see David start with confession, and then this is really cool. Ultimately, his confession leads to, and this is our second point this morning, to his healing, his healing. And now David does something. He prays us through. There's actually more, but I don't have time to cover each one, so we'll just cover four this morning. He prays us through four steps of healing, cleansing, and and, and restoration. Now, this was for him 3,000 years ago, but it's the same for us today. He even uses some language that's similar to us today. God does that. So first off, he says, if if we're really to be healed, he says, we need to be cleansed by the blood. Verse 7, he says, he says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. I know what you're thinking. Um, this sounds random. Like if you go to the internet, which I did, and you Google the word hyssop. Who knows what hyssop means? Don't lie. Who knows what it means? Okay, a couple, but they're like sort of down here. I sort of do. I, I, you know, I've been saying this for, for 20 years. Some years, 30 some years of my salvation. I don't I I think I acted like I knew what it meant. I didn't really know what it meant, so I Googled hyssop, and it comes back as a, a fragrant herb that has a, a, a it's a flower with a stalk and a in a bushy head. I'm like, oh, what huh? So if you go to the internet, that's all you get. But if you go to your Bible concordance, this is what you get. This is interesting. Um, you do a word search and you'll find that hyssop was used, this is really cool, like a brush to spread the blood on the doorposts during the exodus. It, it was also what they used when they asked God to, to cleanse a leper. Now get this, they would, they would take the, the hyssop, the brush, this flower that had dried out, and they would dip it in a slaughtered lamb. And then they would, they would put it over a leper, and he would miraculously be healed by the blood. Now there's some images going on here. There's a word picture. Who's, 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 who's being talked about right here? Jesus. Jesus. The words translated cleanse me um, might more literally be rendered descend me. Oh God, descend me with hyssop. What? Only then will David be clean and, and whiter than snow. So that the, this begs the question can this actually happen for sinners like you and me? Yes, but only by the blood of Jesus. Now, so this begs the second question. Why did Jesus have to die to forgive our sins? Here's the answer. Sin is so deeply embedded in us that it cannot be cured by anything but death. The old life has to die. Now, you ready for this? God cannot improve it. Even God cannot make it better. He cannot cleanse it or or wash it. It, it. He can only put it to death. David understands that, that, understands that now. And so David says to God, if you're going to deal with this terrible fountain of evil inside of me, um, I can see that it must be put to death. It must be cleansed with a hyssop brush that has been dipped in the blood of my Messiah, and then I'll be made whiter than snow. It's only by your blood. The Bible says, you've heard me say it before, but the Bible said it before I did, there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of Jesus' blood. That's how sin-saturated we are. For healing to take place, we need to be cleansed by, by the blood. Secondly, David says we need to have a clean heart. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. The word create means that David uh, knows he can't change himself. Here's the end of all self-reformation. God has to do it. He can't do it. God, you create. I can't. 
The king knows that unless God makes him pure, he will never get there on his own. Not only that, but he prays for a steadfast spirit. So I did a massive word study on that. And I didn't need to, but I did. I was fascinated by it. Literally, it means to stand erect, firm, and tall, prepared for the battle. Pretty good, isn't it? So David says, I have blown it, change me, give me a new heart. And oh, by the way, next time the enemy comes at me, the world, the flesh, and the devil come at me, help me to stand firm, erect, prepared for the battle. And the imagery that comes to mind is Ephesians chapter 6, right? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your steadfast, your stand against the devil's schemes and methodology, which he's got a method book for each one of us in this room. Whoa. Pretty good stuff. For healing to take place, we need to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We need a clean heart. Uh, Thirdly, um, we desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, David says, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, you might want to write this down. We can't do this thing called the Christian life without the Spirit of God. Can't. Paul put it this way, Galatians chapter 5, verse, verses 16 and 17. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of, of the flesh. The implied is, if you don't, you will. If you don't walk by the Spirit, you will gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. This is battle that goes on. And the Spirit, which is contrary to the flesh, they're at war with each other. Um, They're in conflict with each other. And so that you are not to do whatever you want to do. I'll never forget. You may have heard the story before, but bear with me. I'm old, so I'll tell the story again. Um, I was in an evangelism class in seminary many years ago. It just so happened that in this class there was only men. I had many classes with men and women. In this class there was only men. Large class. And uh, I was actually sitting in the back row with a friend of mine named Vic Kucha, who's now a pastor in Florida, but was a brand new believer out of the University of Chicago. And um, Illinois, pardon me, University of Illinois. So we're sitting in the back there, and, and our professor was Dr. Brian Kingsmore, a little bit five foot four, fiery Scottish guy. So I'm now going to go from uh, American accent to my Scottish accent. So bear with me, okay? So Dr. Kingsmore, he said this, he said, he said, laddies, boys, men, listen to me, and you must listen to me. So we're all, whoa, because he started to get really fired up. He said, I need to tell you something. You can do nothing. I mean nothing without the power of the Holy Spirit. And immediately, five guys in the front row went, hallelujah, amen. And Dr. Kingsmore stopped, and he goes, I, I see we have some penties with we, have, have we? And Vic looked at me and he goes, what's a penty? I said, I think it's a Pentecostal person. <laughs> he said, man, do you understand me? You can't share the gospel. You can't live this life. You can't be a good husband. You can't be a good father without the power of the Holy Spirit. We all went, oh, amen. You know what I'm thinking? I like that accent better than mine. Should I go full Scottish from now on? <laughs> Yes. So Jim Hall said in the first service. We need the Holy Spirit. We can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. You've heard me say it before. There's just no middle ground. We, there's no place to hide. Paul says either you live by the power of the Holy Spirit um, and it produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all, all the good fruit. Or you live by the flesh and it produces really, really bad stuff. There's no Switzerland. There's no neutral. There's no middle place to hide. It's one or the other. The stakes are really, really high. And David says, please, I need the Holy Spirit. Please, don't take it away. For healing to take place, we need to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We need a clean heart. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, we need to regain the joy of of God's salvation. Verse 12, David Praise, restore to me the joy of, I need this, I've got to have this, the joy of your salvation. Every sin, whether big or small, separates us from fellowship with God. Isn't that interesting? So, it is perfectly possible to be saved and miserable because we do not deal deal rightly with, with our sin. David says, Lord, I'm tired of being miserable about my miserable life. Open the fountain of joy in my heart 
once again. And I've been, I've been going through the book of Nehemiah in my quiet times. I love it. I can't get enough of it. I go, I go through it. I go back. I'm just, I'm just pecking away, slowly at it. And in the book of Nehemiah, they have, they have rebuilt the walls. But that's not the thing. We get caught up like in task. God wasn't concerned about rebuilding the walls. What do you think he was really concerned about? He was concerned about rebuilding their hearts. I mean, they had completely forgotten about God. They had forgotten about the temple. They had been taken into captivity, and, and Nehemiah asked a foreign king, can I please go back and restore the walls? And he was, he was broken, and the king says, sure, go ahead. And he goes back, and he restores the walls. And then when they restore the wall, Ezra, the, the prophet, the pastor, comes out, and he reads the book of the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Literally, he blows the dust off. People are like, what is this? These are God's people. As he begins to read the book of the law, revival breaks out. Repentance, mourning, fasting, it's unbelievable. And finally, they're so caught up in their sorrow over their sin, that's a good thing, that Nehemiah has to remind them. In your confession, there's joy. As a matter of fact, he says these words, which you have sang many times. He says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Oh. Let me say this, there is and should be obviously a somberness over our sin, but there should also be joy in our salvation. Jesus said, I, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's his design. That's his design. Because of our salvation, we should sing songs like this. Sing it with me. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Where? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Yes. Where's Andrew? I'm coming after you, buddy. <laughs> Confession and, and healing. Remember, there's an order. When I confess, when I'm broken, when I lay out before God and acknowledge, I have sin he begins the process of healing and then it leads to thirdly this morning it's beautiful to devotion to devotion when david repented of his sin and confessed and, and was healed it actually looked like something he was no longer the same the same guy he had a new devotion to god two things took place a, as a result of, of his change first we see i love this he finds evangelistic purpose and passion. Verse 13, then, looking back, then after I confess and I'm healed, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. David's saying, I, I, I want everybody to experience the grace and mercy that I have experienced, and so I will teach transgressors your way. I'm, I'm going to go salt and light with everybody I, I meet. L please listen. The cross will never be more beautiful than when we see it in light of our own sinfulness. <laughs> like every, I can't even watch it. Every single time I watch the passion of the Christ, I'm, I'm like two minutes in and I begin to weep. Because all I can visualize is Jesus walked those streets and lived his life and went to that cross. It's my sin, it's my sin, it's my sin. He did this for me. He did it for me. He rescued me. It's all I can visualize. I, 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 I'm undone. <coughs> David says, I am so undone, I've got to tell people about this. I've got to turn, turn them from their ways. And when we see that, we can't help but desire for others to experience the same. Imagine if someone saved you from a burning building, a flood, an angry mob, um, a selfie picture gone wrong, whatever. There's no chance you would not recount that story and thank that person profusely forever. That's what David says. I got to tell people about you. You've changed me. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing we see as a result of his confession and healing is is he, he becomes a, a radical evangelist. Second thing, he becomes a radical worshiper. 
Like worship, worship becomes his lifestyle. Verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior and my tongue. Get this, when that happens, it'll sing of your righteousness. Verse 15, open my lips, Lord, and, and my mouth will declare your praise. Spurgeon has one of the all-time great quotes. I don't know how he thinks of these things. He says this, and I quote, a great sinner pardoned makes a great singer. Isn't that good? David never forgot his sin or the grace that found him in the midst of his despair. Thus, his, even though his lips were, were shut, when grace, when he experienced grace like a river, then he would not be silent. Truly forgiven people sing about what God has done for them. They can't help it. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 that spirit-filled people, the byproduct of being filled by the spirit and being a son and daughter of God is that we sing. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. This is interesting. He says, do not get drunk on wine. In the grammatical flow of that passage, he then basically is implying, and then what do you get drunk on? That's the implication. Well, what do you mean? Which well, is, don't get drunk on wine because that leads to debauchery. That's not good. Instead, be filled with or be drunk with the Holy Spirit of God. Wait, what's the what's the result? Well, here's what happens when you're drunk, when you're filled with the Spirit of God. You begin to speak to one another with psalms. Remember, that's a song. With hymns and songs from the Spirit. Not only that, you sing and you make music from your heart to the Lord. <laughs> like, you can't help yourself. Like, you've been around that person at work. You're both fascinated with and love and annoyed at the same time. That person who just, just singing to Jesus all the time, and you know they're legit. That's the Holy Spirit, just evident, just as a result of what God has done for me. I'm going to sing, and you're not going to stop me. David says, I've become even more undignified than this. His wife is like, hey, keep it down. No, I'm not going to keep it down. I'm going, to, I'm going to blast it up. I'm going to dance and sing and become even more foolish than this. As we conclude... I want us to go back to God's man, the prophet Nathan, as the worship team comes on up. And I think we need to do this because um, we need more Nathans in this world, in our lives. We need to be a Nathan. We need to thank God for Nathan's example. We need to thank God for someone in all the kingdom who had enough courage to trust God, now, now get ready for this, to speak truth to power. To speak truth to power. To call sin, sin, and to raise David to a higher standard. So maybe this morning you're like, I know it's going to be hard, but God has called me to be a Nathan. God has called me in the spirit of Galatians 5 lovingly, gently to approach someone in my life that, that they're going down a path they don't need to go down. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a spouse. And they desperately need you as a prophetic word from God to speak truth into their life. Now, some of you are saying, Lee, I, I don't need to be a Nathan. I need a Nathan in my life. I'm, I am reckless. I'm on a path that's dangerous. I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. And I need a Nathan to come speak to me. And I would say this. That person doesn't need you to judge them. That person needs you to speak the gospel over them. The Bible says that you and I have made decisions, and I'm at the top of the list, that are worthy of our eternal death. The Bible is really clear. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But here's what the gospel says. Our hero, our rescuer, our savior, Jesus took that penalty for us. You might have made a, a devastatingly bad sexual decision, which should potentially ruin your life. But Jesus has taken your penalty for that, and now he specializes in resurrection and repair. 
That means that even when we make a mistake like David did, God can heal and even use it for good in our life and the life of others. You see, right now, maybe some of you are, are feeling the discouragement in your soul that comes from sin and it's pushing you down into despair. That's not God. I want you to see this on the screen because this is God right here. God calls us upward into hope. That's God. The world, the devil, maybe even your own flesh says there's no hope for me. God says because of the resurrection, because of Jesus, there is hope. Jesus went to the cross so he could erase our past. And he was raised from the dead so he could recreate our future. That's the God we serve. Let me leave you with this. Let me leave you with this. It's a simple line. I say it to myself often because I'm such a significant sinner. And I struggle. I struggle each and every day. I'm preaching the gospel as Jim and I have been saying the last few weeks. We're preaching it to ourselves every day. But I want to leave you with this. Sin is it's great. But God's grace is greater. Sin is great, but God's grace is greater. Throw yourself at the mercy of Jesus. Guess what? His arms are wide open. Like a prodigal, he waits. And he runs. And he loves. And he holds. And he weeps. And he forgives. That's my Jesus. That's your Jesus. Let's pray. We rebuke the lies of the devil in Jesus' name. He's a liar. He's a destroyer. He is reckless and wants us to live the same way. We rebuke that in Jesus' name and we say, Jesus, thank you for salvation. Thank you that when we turn from our sin and turn to you as Savior and Lord, we become sons and daughters, adopted, chosen, special. And so, Father, help us to walk in that. As David said, help us to be steadfast, to stand firm, resisting the world, the flesh, and the devil. Father God, for those in here who are wondering what this thing, uh, salvation, means, what's it all about, I pray that you would make it clear to them that it's all about grace. It's all about Jesus, and it's not about them. I pray for hearts today that would, that would who know you and love you, that today would be the day where they would turn and follow and be devoted. There would be confession and healing and devotion all over this room, all across the city. And God, for those who don't know you, I pray today would be the day of salvation. And we ask this in Jesus' name. This time I would like the prayer teams to come on up. And you're going to see people standing to my left and to my right and all around this room. And these are awesome people. They're just like you. Sinners saved by God's grace, but they want to pray for you. Last service, I felt a burden on my heart so deep about something in my life. And I went up to two of our prayer warriors and they laid their hands on me. And they prayed for me. I wept like a baby. I just experienced God's grace and renewal and freedom and presence. Just a brother and a sister, two or more gathered. Jesus was in the midst. Prayer is powerful. Maybe you're like, I, I can't wait to get to that communion table. Because sitting over there at that table is the body and the blood of Jesus and I get to preach the gospel to myself thank you Jesus thank you go do it find someone to do it with I would encourage you as Paul did the church in Corinth make sure you confess sin just deal with your stuff before you take it he said don't drink this or take this in a manner that's unworthy just deal with your stuff and then say thank you Jesus you may have noticed and you saw it at the end of announcements that we have a baptismal set up over there. Maybe like our brother who said, I've been a believer a long time, but um, I've, I finally said, I need to be obedient. 
Maybe that's where you're at. And you're like, I just need to be obedient. Tell the world I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus commanded it. I didn't make it up. It's not a pastor thing. It's a Jesus thing. And there's some sort of breaking in the heaven when we do that. When we step out in faith and just say, God, I'm going to tell the world I'm a follower of you. Jesus, do what only you can do in our lives. By your power, your grace, your spirit. Amen.